All right, thank you, everybody. So um, when I walked in the door, the first thing that I heard was a conversation about uh, salinity-driven stratification. And I thought, uh, these are my people. <laughs> this is deeply exciting. Uh, I hope the presentation, though, is, is sort of detailed enough, but I've made it shortish, so we have plenty of time for extra questions and discussions. But as the title implies, um, I'm going to focus on sea level rise and specifically on some uh, new, uh, an, an updated assessment of sea level rise that we are working on that's intended to be statewide that follows up on some of those localized assessments that were referenced, which I'll also um, reference um, further along in the talk. An alternative title, um, which many of you are probably aware, uh, or why you should care about Antarctica. Um, why, after this talk, uh, hopefully you decide to become a Antarctica watcher. Um, so first of all, just a, a little bit more uh, about Sea Grant in case you uh, are unfamiliar with it. I'm guessing many of you are. I work for the Sea Grant program, uh, University of Washington-based program. We essentially try to do two things. We try to make this connection between communities and science, uh, specifically on is marine issues that communities need to manage around. As was mentioned, I work in the area of coastal hazards, inclusive of climate change hazards or climate change related hazards. Uh, also tsunamis, chronic erosion, that sort of thing. We also uh, fund marine research. And then, um, you know, a lot of what I'm going to mention today is based on work that I did as part of these sort of local scale uh, climate change assessments that were mentioned, one for the Jamestown tribe, and then we did one uh, for um, a resource conservation district that covers the North Olympic Peninsula and then one for Island County, and now we're trying to sort of take these methods, many of which I'm gonna to describe to you, uh, and do a, a statewide assessment. This is really sort of like an impacts assessment. How much sea level rise do we expect? What are the uncertainties? Um, but then, you know, ideally, communities take that information and do a vulnerability assessment and adaptation planning process, which is really where you start to identify what's valuable in the community, what's at risk, and then what options do we have for addressing it. And then so this is the, uh, the project, this regional resilience project, NOAA funded, is the project in which we're attempting to take some of these uh, tools that we created as part of these local assessments and move them statewide. Um, this regional resilience project um, is a big tent project. It's got a lot of partners um, represented by all the logos on the side. And uh, it's got a whole variety of objectives, most of them focused on um, once you have sort of sea level rise assessment information, impacts information, how do we go about the process of, of moving that into sort of a community sphere so that you're actually planning with it or doing something with it? That's the bulk of this project, although what I'm going to focus on today are the top bullets which are focused on that uh, impacts side of the coin. Okay. So let's get started, though, with sea level rise, which I blame on these two guys. Um, some of you may know these fine-looking gentlemen. Uh, John Tyndall was, uh, was the guy in 1864. He was a chemist, and he was interested in the properties of, of, uh, of substances. And he, and he uh, did an investigation about the properties of carbon dioxide gas. And one of the things he found was that if you passed heat energy through that gas, not as much came out at the end as you put in. So some of that was absorbed by that gas. So he wrote up a paper, published it. It sat around for 30 years until, or somewhere around 30 years, a couple decades, um, until Savante Arrhenius picked it up and made uh, what I view as sort of the big uh, leap that we now sort of uh, know as the conceptual model for climate change. He was the one that said, hey, if what John wrote about this gas is true and we pump enough of it into the air, we can warm things up. Uh, we could warm up uh, our surroundings a little bit. He was from Denmark, and he thought that would be just the greatest thing. <laughs> um, and he thought, you know, he sort of viewed it as a way to tinker with the environment, uh, uh, improve agriculture. Um, but he's the one that made this leap and did the calculations to show that it was possible based on um, uh, you know, potential emissions of carbon dioxide effects of, effectively. Um, so I really sort of say, you know, attribute the conceptual model of climate change that we now use to Svante Arrhenius. Uh, 
This is that conceptual model. Uh, many of you have probably seen this or much more complex models of climate change. The um, panel furthest from me is intended to sort of uh, uh, um, um, show this notion of a balanced global energy budget where you have the sun um, uh, emitting light energy, which is being taken up by the global system represented here. The Earth warms up and then re-radiates that heat energy back out into space, represented by this aerial. And if roughly the same amount goes in as comes out, then that global uh, uh, energy system is roughly in balance and the Earth roughly stays at, at the same temperature over long time frames. The notion behind climate change is that we're sort of toying with this arrow with those greenhouse gases, inclusive of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. And by adding more of them, we're reducing the amount of that heat energy that, that escapes back out into space. So we're playing with that budget a little bit over time. And um, we can ask ourselves uh, if, uh, I forgot the equation, I apologize. <laughs> so down here at the bottom, is an equation, which hopefully everyone recognizes from your high school physics course. This is the heat flux equation. And uh, it's a really nice, elegant way that we can understand uh, changes in temperature of substances based on how much energy goes in or out of them, the energy flux, which is represented by Q. And to get at that change in temperature, which is delta T, we have to know M, which is the mass of the substance and then C, which is the specific heat of that substance, which is a fixed quantity that tells us, well, how, much, how many calories or joules does it take to warm up the unit mass of that substance by one degree Celsius? So a really nice, elegant way to understand um, changes in temperature with heat transfer. And uh, you can sort of do this exercise with the atmosphere, uh, and if you know that sort of change in the Earth's energy budget, due to playing with this arrow, then we should be able to calculate the change in temperature of the atmosphere over some time frame. And people smarter than, than I have sort of worked out those budgets to understand uh, how much extra energy we've sort of built up in the Earth's atmosphere over the last, say, 50, 60 years. And you can, so you have that value Q, and then you can just Google the mass of the atmosphere, get that, and obviously the specific heat of air. And if you do this equation for the atmosphere, you find that that delta T, that change in temperature, should be on the order of about 70 degrees Celsius since about 1960. 70 degrees Celsius estimated change in temperature based on this estimated uh, energy imbalance in the Earth system due to climate change since about 1960. Has the temperature changed that much? Of course, the answer is no, um, and there's a uh, uh, the re I already sort of gave it away, so I showed you this already. But the reason is embedded in this particular uh, uh, time series. So here we've got time since 1960, and then on this axis is change in total heat or energy content since 1961. It's divided into two uh, sinks for that energy or that heat. Uh, the red is representing that part of it that is in the atmosphere or retained in the land or went into melting ice. And the blue, the lion's share of it, is the portion of it that was sucked up by the ocean. And the, so the ocean is doing us this phenomenal service in terms of that energy imbalance. Um, and the other cool thing about the ocean doing this, as compared to the atmosphere, is that the ocean's mass is much larger than the atmosphere, and the specific heat of water is much larger. So it takes more energy to warm up a unit mass of water as compared to air. So, the outcome is that the ocean can do this and warm up almost imperceptibly. So this is a phenomenal service in terms of uh, buffering climate change. However, that heat does have consequences. And in regards to sea level rise, climactically controlled sea level rise, there are really two big processes that drive it. And these are things that we tend to be uh, comfortable with. We tend to interact with them on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the first is that if we have ice and we expose it to heat, it melts, right? So we, uh, we know this uh, intimately. And the other is that if we heat up water, it expands. So uh, you may know this if only because your hot water tank uh, 
has an expansion tank on it to deal with its properties so the water doesn't spill on your floor. So if we think about this on a global scale, we can actually see these two processes at play in terms of observed sea level change globally. And that's what's depicted at the bottom. Here again, we have a time axis on the bottom. And then global average sea level change. This is measured in millimeters. So this axis is on the order of about an inch. This is a, about a 10-year time series. And there's four lines here. Um, this blue line at the bottom, which you can barely distinguish from the purple, but it's doable. This blue line at the bottom is an estimate of the change in the ocean's uh, average elevation effectively due to warming, so due to expansion. It's called the steric component. This is measured using uh, the Argo float system, which is an autonomous temperature monitoring system. These sort of things bobbing around the ocean. They sort of dive down, measure temperature, come back to the surface, beam their data uh, back to someplace. And then the red is an estimate uh, of the sea level influence due to the change in the ocean's mass. And this is based on this GRACE satellite system, satellites that are designed specifically to measure cha uh, changes in mass on the Earth's surface. And so this is an estimate of the change in mass of the oceans, and that mass is from new water uh, being melted and contributed to the ocean basins. And then if you add those two up, the red line and the blue line, you get the purple line. Uh, the, that's just a sum of those two lines. And then the black here is a altimetry-based, so an independent estimate of the average change in the ocean surface. This is globally averaged. So uh, the thing we're looking for there is if the purple line and the black line uh, meet up together, sort of roughly align, that's a good sign. It and it tells us that these two um, processes that drive the blue and the red line, which is melting of ice and expansion of water, are driving that observed record of sea level change over this time frame, roughly 10 years. So, and the game for doing sea level rise projections is essentially to try to understand those two processes at play on the Earth's surface. And, um, and we think of this in terms of what are called sea level rise components. There, there are four big ones. They can be divided in any number of ways. But essentially what we try to think about are the contributions from these big masses of land-grounded ice distributed around the globe. Greenland, shown here. Antarctica, shown here. Mountain glaciers, shown here. And then the other component shown here is this, this steric component, this, this thermal expansion component, and its contributions to sea level rise. So for each of those, you try to understand the climate influences on that component. You add them all up and you come up with some kind of sea level rise projection, often communicated like it is down here, where you have, in this case, you have an observed record, time axis on the bottom, some distance unit along the side, and then you've got a set of projections here represented with these blue polygons. In this case, there are three different sort of methods for doing this process, three different sort of processes, if you will, different sets of assumptions. And you can see they sort of give you slightly different answers. And the key thing I want you to note here is the uncertainty, right? Especially as you move further and further away from the present, we have more and more uncertainty in terms of what to expect. And that's largely driven by uncertainty about how climate interacts with these processes or these components. Turns out that it's hard to understand how something like Antarctica responds to climate change. Uh, it's not an easy thing. Now, why do we care only about land-grounded ice? So I, wanna, I, I have a little demonstration here. This may be sort of intuitively obvious, but it's always fun to have like colored water and do things. <laughs> so let's, let's do that. So we're going to create two ocean systems. And let me say this is in contrast to sea ice, um, which uh, there's a lot of on the Earth and um, often gets conflated with sea level rise. So we've got two ocean systems here. I've made the water blue just so you can sort of see it. And in one of them, I've got my sea ice system right there. Oh, I am going to add some sea ice into it without hopefully making a giant mess. All right. And then once we've got our sea ice in there, I'm going to move this paper up to mark the level of the ocean. 
about like that, I think. All right, my other system is going to be a land ice system. So in this particular system, I'm going to have a continent, this funnel, and I'm going to add my ice to that continent. And then I'm going to mark the level of the ocean. And then basically, as I continue along here blowing a lot of hot air, <laughs> the ice in both of these is going to melt, and we're going to be able to observe which ocean changes level as that ice melts, right? So when you think about it this way, it starts to become obvious and sort of intuitively obvious about what we care about in terms of sea level rise. In this particular system, and this is analogous to the sea ice system, if you will, as that ice melts, it's already displacing water. So as it melts, we wouldn't expect to see any change of the level of this ocean. In this particular system, this, uh, this water is going gonna, is gonna to be adding to the volume that's already in here. And so we would expect to see the level change here. So this is going to be representative of, of Greenland, Antarctica, at least the components that are grounded on ice, mountain glaciers, whereas this is analogous to sea ice. And I only bring this up because this is frequently misrepresented in the media. Uh, sea ice is, um, is an important climate change indicator but uh, sea ice patterns don't have anything directly to do with sea level change. Can you say sea ice is the yes, in fact, the Arctic is sort of the poster child for sea ice, although obviously there is sea ice around Antarctica as well. This is also confusing, interestingly enough, for those of you that follow uh, stories about these large um, um, ice shelf uh, ruptures, right? So ice shelves are mostly floating. And so when those things sort of break off, uh, they do not themselves directly contribute much, if any, to sea level change. The concern, though, and the reason that they are important from the standpoint of sea level rise is because they're thought to buttress or hold back some of the land-grounded ice that is behind them. And the thought is that when those break off and float away, that that allows that ice to accelerate, which does add new volume into the ocean. So it's kind of an interesting sort of uh, thing to think about. Okay, so let me go through, I'm going to sort of uh, arrange the rest of the talk about sort of three different things that we're doing to try to address uh, some of the issues we've seen in previous sea level rise assessments. And the first thing I noted, of course, was that uncertainty represented right here by this large range and these different styles of um, projection. You know, this was represented in uh, the first sea level rise assessment that we had for Washington State, the Moat Report, published about 10 years ago, shown right here. This is freely available online. It's a really nice document, really uh, actually fairly commonly cited in documents like Shoreline Master Plans in Washington State, but really didn't seem to sort of make its way into significant vulnerability assessment. And Part of the reason may have been that at the time, there weren't these tools available to really deal with uncertainty in these large ranges. So the projections that were communicated in this report are shown here. They've got 2050 and 2100, and then a scale that goes from three inches up to 50 inches, so a little bit over four feet. For uh, each of these time frames, they did provide sort of a best estimate, six inches and 13 inches, but then they had this big sort of bar um, without really much in the way of tools to understand how sort of uncertainty was distributed within that bar. So from a planner standpoint, it was really hard to deal with this. There's a significant difference in terms of planning for six inches by 2100, very manageable, as compared to four feet by 2100. And so this was a, a, a struggle. So we're, we've turned in uh, some of those recent assessments that, that I showed you and for this uh, updated uh, regional resilience project, that we're doing now to this probabilistic framework for thinking about possible future sea level change. So for each of those components uh, that contribute to global sea level, here you see Greenland, glaciers and ice caps, thermal expansion in Antarctica. For each of those, you actually see a series of lines which represent a probability or a likelihood distribution. And in this particular case, the, the dark black line is the best estimate. And then as you move away from that dark black line, you just have sort of, uh, sort of it moves away towards the tails of the distribution. Um, so it gives you a sense for how likely the contributions are from each of these different sources. And then you can combine those to come up with a, with a, a set of sea level rise projections that have this likelihood assessment associated with them. You'll note 
that the range isn't any less. This is 2100, and this is in fact projections for Washington State. So you've got a range here that spans from half a foot up to above eight feet. So the range is actually wider than it was for the moat report. But the distinguishing feature here is that if you look at the legend, each of these lines has a likelihood assessment associated with it. So from a planning standpoint, the notion is that uh, we're at least providing information for perhaps some more nuanced vulnerability discussions, some uh, cost-benefit sorts of discussions, that sort of thing. You'll also note that our sort of most, our best estimate and most likely range is still here in this two to three foot zone that's been uh, sort of a feature of sea level rise projections for t at least 10 years or so, somewhere in that two to three foot zone. But there's this much sort of can't, can't be excluded higher magnitude sea level change possibility, lower likelihood based on this assessment. And for those of you that are sea level rise nerds, and there may be some of you in the room, you'll note that this is up where um, some, there's been a f sort of some papers published in the past three or four years that provide mechanisms for reaching these higher magnitudes of sea level rise and even suggest that there's a higher likelihood than maybe we think. Uh, but that's where those sorts, of, um, those sorts of papers kind of live, is up in that higher magnitude zone. I, sh I also should point out that there's also an observed record here. Uh, which is based on Washington State tide gauge data, uh, in this case with the vertical land movement components taken out. And I'll get to that in just a second. So it's also worth noting that there's also uncertainty due to emissions. The uncertainty that you saw on the previous slide is only the uncertainty due to how little we know about processes that drive sea level change. There's also uncertainty due to emissions. Um, and these are the four different um, uh, family of emissions scenarios that are used by climate modelers around the globe. These are, so you've got time along the bottom and then you've got sort of a CO2 uh, concentration estimate for these four different emission scenarios. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, for sea level rise, it's relatively insensitive to emission scenario. There is some benefit to mitigation, but if you look at some of the projections, the suggestion is really that we should still be thinking about sea level rise almost regardless of what emission scenario we end up following over the next uh, century. And this is, this is a summary table that we're playing with that's designed to communicate this. We've got three different time steps, 2050, 2100, 2150. And then for each of those, you've got four different emission scenarios and then a bunch of sea level projections and feet associated with a bunch of different likelihoods. Um, and you can sort of look at kind of any of those likelihoods and get a sense for the variability across those emission scenarios. And you'll note that there is, you know, there is some benefit towards mitigation if you look at the variation, but we still have sea level rise planning that we probably should be doing almost regardless, what we call adaptation planning, regardless of what emission scenario we end up uh, actualizing in real life. Okay, so now let's turn our attention a little bit more regionally. Um, and notice a couple of interesting things. So this upper plot here is the satellite altimetry-based estimate of global average sea level change since the early 90s. This is a satellite-derived estimate, globally averaged. So you've probably heard or seen this. This gives us that number of three millimeters per year that's commonly cited as a global average rate of sea level change, roughly eight to nine inches per century or so. Um, however, if you take this global average and you break it down spatially across the planet, some interesting things start to emerge, and that's what this map at the uh, lower right is intended to convey. So here, those rates are now shown as a uh, color scale, with hot colors being faster rates of sea level change on the order of 9 to 12 to 15 millimeters per year, and cool colors being actually sea level fall. And you'll notice that there's a lot of spatial distribution to that pattern. There are places where the rates are much higher, especially like in the Eastern Pacific, and then there are parts of the globe where that sea level pattern suggests falling sea level, and then we happen to live in an area where it appears we're sort of hovering around zero over that record, maybe a little bit more than zero, but lower than the global average. So what's going on here? 
Um, what drives this kind of pattern? Well, there's a couple different hypotheses out there, but one of them certainly is associated with what we call sea level fingerprinting. And so um, this is a, uh, I think, something that gives you headaches, but bear with me for a second. So the way to think about this is uh, I think about it as ice hugging the ocean. So the notion is that you have these large masses of ice distributed around the globe. This, this particular map is related to Antarctica. Down here, massive, massive pile of ice, essentially. And as that, uh, as that pile of ice melts and its mass starts to distribute in the ocean, the mass of that ice changes. And the mass of that ice is so large that it actually has an influence on the gravitational field that's affecting ocean water globally. So the notion is that if you imagine uh, uh, sort of melting one inch of sea level rise equivalent water volume off that mass of ice, everywhere around the world does not see one inch of sea level rise. It's in fact distributed based on this color bar that you see here. So places nearer to Antarctica actually experience sea level fall, which is a mind-boggling thing to ponder, right? And then places that are further from Antarctica experience, in some cases, a little more than an inch. Um, like we live in an area that would be expected to see more than an inch based off of Antarctica melting an inch equivalent of sea level, global average sea level rise, right? So this is one of the reasons why Antarctica matters to us. Interestingly enough, if we look at the equivalent for Greenland, so here you see that same pattern of Greenland uh, of sea level falling near Greenland as it melts. And you see that we though, uh, oh, the scale got cut off, it's back here, it's a little yellow. So we see less than an inch from Greenland melting an equivalent of an inch of sea level rise from its ice. So this particular process probably partially accounts for those patterns that we observe in the altimetry uh, map that I showed you. And it also leads to um, projections like this. This is a real common um, uh, feature of sea level rise projections when we compare the global projection versus our regional projection. This is comparing the global versus the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Right, this is right around the best estimates for 2030, 2050, and 2100. And you can see in all places the best estimate for the Strait of Juan de Fuca is a little less than the global, right? So that's um, maybe good news. I don't know, it's kind of different ways of looking at it, right? Um, maybe good news for us. Uh, these best estimates, though, frequently assume that Antarctica does not contribute that much. And so that's another reason why Antarctica really matters to us. If Antarctica becomes a big contributor to sea level change, we see a little more than the global average. Another reason, yeah, another reason to pay attention to Antarctica. Okay, so finally, let's uh, get local. Um, so we have to build those kinds of considerations in when we're trying to project sea level rise for use at community planning scales here in Washington. The other thing we have to take into account is what we call, uh, well, we have to think about this in terms of relative sea level change. And relative sea level is the water le ocean's water level measured against the land. That's really what we care about when it comes from the standpoint of a community. And this is a schematic of a tide gauge. Tide gauges measure relative sea level directly. The tide gauge may actually be moving up or down with the land, even as the ocean is moving as well. So we can think of relative sea level as being a function of what we call absolute sea level, just what the ocean is doing, and then that vertical land movement component, VLM. So we can see this embedded as well in some of our long-term water level records from around Washington State. These are from the NOAA Tides and Currents website, um, which some of you may be familiar with. Cherry Point has a tide gauge, and so um, um, a great place to look for long-term water level records, temperature records, you know, daily water level, what have you. And these are the long-term records from Seattle and Nia Bay in this particular case. I chose these because they're uh, two of our longer water level records in Washington State. Seattle's our longest, dates back to 1895. And then Nia Bay is close, dates back to 1937, I think. These are monthly average water levels. And um, you'll notice two different trends associated with these two different tide gauges. And those differences where uh, uh, sea, relative sea level in Seattle is rising and relative sea level in Nia Bay is falling over these time frames, 
And these are due to differences in vertical land movement between these two communities. So when we start to think about community applications, what we actually need to do is estimate the vertical land movement component and build that into projections for community, especially if that community is going dramatically upwards or dramatically downwards. This is an example for uh, the project we did across the Strait of Juan de Fuca. So here's Nia Bay uh, along this uh, line transect from Nia Bay into Seattle. On here you have tide gauges represented as black circles. And then G uh, continuous GPS stations represented as, as, I'm sorry I said black circles, I meant black squares. I do know my shapes. Um, and then we have continuous GPS stations represented as circles. These are uh, GPS systems that are sort of mounted on the landscape, logging more or less continuously. We can start to use them to understand vertical land movements. Um, and this is a, tr a pattern uh, from, from west to east across that transect where this line divides uplift from subsidence, right? And so we see this clear gradient from Nia Bay, which is uplifting fairly rapidly, about three millimeters per year, which equates to almost, you know, nine, 10 inches over a century, somewhere around there. And then as you uh, transition into the Eastern Strait to Port Townsend in Seattle, these data suggest subsidence. Rates of about a millimeter per year, or roughly three inches over a century or something like that. So these rates are not extreme relative to projected climate change, sea level change, but they do drive differences in how those communities expect or may already be um, experiencing sea level change. So this, for example, um, these are projection tables for Nia Bay, Port Angeles, and Port Townsend. Uh, across the top, they've got three dates, 2030, 2050, and 2100. And then you've got a bunch of probabilities down here. Don't worry about all the numbers, just the ones I've circled. These are the best estimate projections for 2050 for these three communities, 0 0.3 feet for Nia Bay, 0.6 feet for Port Angeles and 0.9 feet for Port Townsend, right? So each community is expecting something slightly different just by a couple inches, but this is a game where inches potentially matter um, uh, as their best estimate by that uh, mid-century time frame. And then we can, of course, combine that information. We've got our probabilistic projections. We've got our vertical land movement information. We can combine those uh, to come up with a relative sea level projection that's appropriate for uh, application at the community scale. This is an example from the Dungeness River Delta on the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And the nice thing about these probabilistic projections as compared to, say, a scenario, is that we can plot them together in a map view. So what you're seeing here um, is, is these different shades of blue are related to different likelihoods or different probabilities, right? So this is potentially an interesting thing to think about when you're thinking about prioritizing actions, prioritizing locations for, um, for particular actions. You might uh, prioritize an area that has a likely, a more likely, a higher likelihood of impact as compared to a place that has a lower likelihood of impact, which this map would potentially be useful for getting at. Okay, and then it's worth noting that our current best available science for sea level change represented by this 2012 report, Sea Level Rise for the Coasts of California, Oregon, and Washington, um, took the approach of what we call regionalizing vertical land movement. So instead of trying to identify these spatial differences that are really relevant to communities, they just said, hey, the whole area north of Cape Mendocino is uh, going up a little bit. Um, which is sort of true for some places, not true for others, right? So one of the reasons we're doing this is because we feel like that's an important component uh, for community scale planning. And so as part of that regional resilience project, we're now trying to take the statewide view. So this is hot off the uh, shelf, not the shelf, hot out of the computer um, about a week or two ago. And this is our statewide vertical land movement assessment. Um, and what you see here are a bunch of dots representing our uh, different data sources that went into the product. These include, again, vertical land movement estimates from tide gauges, from continuous GPS stations, and then also in here, there's places where you see these circles that are kind of arrayed along these lines, like this, or along Hood Canal, or along the Strait. Those are actually 
Department of Transportation monuments that they use for you know, projects, elevation monuments that get resurveyed every couple decades and you can use those to derive information about whether the landscape's going up or down. So that's embedded in this product as well. And then these, uh, the squares are just the interpolated uh, surface. And, so, and then in this case, hot colors are uplift, cool colors are subsidence. Um, and you'll notice that we live in a landscape in which there's a lot of variability in terms of vertical land movement. Um, not surprisingly, this area probably is going up a little bit, uh, although the, what I'm not gonna show you is the uncertainty map. There are places that have large uncertainties, and this is one of them. Um, so I wouldn't take this to the bank quite yet. Um, but um, gives us a sense for how to treat relative sea level in each of these different areas around the state. <clears throat> All right, so the final thing I wanted to point out is that we don't just care about average sea level, which is what sort of those projections are intended to get at, right? It tells us maybe something useful about how mean high or high water changes, which is kind of what we use as our average sea level on the landscape. But in fact, what people tend to care about and what we tend to experience first in terms of sea level rise impacts are on the extremes. This is an image of, um, of an extreme coastal flooding event from Seattle. This is Alki Point. This was uh, December 2012, tied the record for the previous high water mark, which had been uh, reached in 1983 during that year's strong El Nino. Um, and so it's these kind of events. And for us, they tend to be wintertime events. They tend to be when we have a high tide that co-occurs with uh, low pressure. We get storm surge and you get these big events. But all those processes are oscillating on top of some mean uh, trend line, right? And so the, the, the expectation is that you change the magnitude or the frequency of occurrence of events like these um, associated with sea level change. So to get at that, what we tried to do um, for our island county assessment, and we're sort of trying to figure out how we're gonna do this statewide, is to take, again, turn to tide gauge data this is a, a time series from four different tide gauges, Port Townsend, Seattle, Cherry Point, and Friday Harbor. And from each tide gauge, we've pulled out the highest water level observed in that year relative to mean high or high water. So this scale is meters relative to mean high or high water. So it ranges from 0.2 up to 1.2, with our highest value being on the order of about a meter, right? So that tells us that, in general, our sort of worst case event uh, drives water about three feet above mean high or high water. And then there are some years where we reach maybe half of that. Um, and then some years where we barely exceed a foot. Just kind of depends upon the roll of the dice for that year in terms of tides and storm surge and pressure and that kind of thing. But what we can do is we can take all those observations and we can plot them as a histogram, which is what you see here, where now we've got that um, height above mean high or high water on this axis and this tells us the number of events, and we can start to get the sense going into any given year what the probability is that we will have an event that drives water uh, up to a certain threshold relative to our contemporary mean high or high water. So it gives us kind of an uncertainty distribution, if you will. Well, we can merge that directly with our sea level rise projections, also in that kind of probabilistic framework to come up with an assessment of how extreme water level will change uh, uh, when we start to take into account sea level rise and its uncertainties. So that's what we've done here. Um, this is the same table you saw before for these three separate communities. And we've, we've now added our current, um, what we call extreme annual coastal flood magnitude. This is in feet. And so these are associated with the probability. And then here we've just coupled them with our sea level rise probabilities. Um, and you can see that the numbers are a little higher than for that, the, the mean sea level change. That's because these are your once a year extreme events. Whereas this would be a way to get at your expectation for your daily high tide inundation. So they tell you something different about different types of impacts. We can also map that kind of information. This is for Port Townsend. 2050, here down here at the legend, we've got our different levels of likelihood. And Port Townsend's a relatively steep landscape, as characterizes a lot of uh, uh, coastal Washington. And so in this particular case, you see there's really few vulnerabilities for mean sea level that emerge if you were to examine a map of Port Townsend. 
But when you think about that extreme annual event, you see some vulnerabilities that emerge. Um, and the key thing is, but you could compare this, for example, to either the modern day map or a, something like a FEMA flood map and get a sense for where new vulnerabilities emerge, right? And those might be places where you may want to target uh, a vulnerability assessment, adaptation strategy, planning. So, oh man, I missed, got that wrong. Anyway, <laughs> thank you. I think that says questions, discussions, or arguments. Um, I put that there because I gave a talk to the Squim Bay Yacht Club on Tuesday, who are not as receptive an audience as you are <laughs> for uh, a sea level rise topic. <laughs> and so I wanted to sort of, you know, urge their arguments. <laughs> so anyway, thank you so much. Um, I think we have a few minutes for uh, questions or discussion, if there are any. Oh, and you can also, of course, continue to check out the ocean system for the next 15 minutes. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, oh. Mike, wait for the mic. Thank you. Uh, this is such, uh, this question is kind of in, in the realm of your obvious, but I'll ask it anyway. What effect on storm surge events does rising yeah. sea level have? Does it make them worse or, make, or, or are they relatively the same? So we are assuming uh, that they are relatively the same. That is an assumption, um, but that's largely because we haven't had a specific test of that hypothesis. There has been some work to look at any potential changes to historic, like whether there's been any uh, historic uh, changes in the historic record that we get from places like Seattle, or most of the work's, work's been done for San Francisco, because it's got the longest water level record on the West Coast, and it suggests Probably not. Um, there, you know, there are some, there's some variability in patterns of storm surge, but uh, sort of the overall conclusion is um, they are not, uh, they're not large. Um, and uh, where it's been examined um, in t related to climate change modeling, it's inconclusive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seawalls, which they were not built for that. Right, yep. And modified shorelines, which aren't built for that. And so the relative effect is going to be worse than expected, perhaps. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, one of the things I get asked a lot, especially in sort of restoration, uh, amongst restoration practitioners, is, you know, we're showing this kind of information. And um, at the same time, you know, within Sea Grant, for example, like I do this kind of sea level rise work, and at the same time, we're also sort of in this like, let's remove seawalls kind of thing, you know? And people view that as being problematic. I actually do not, right? Because, um, because of this idea that, um, that natural shorelines are built to respond to variation, right? Whereas armored shorelines largely are not, at least without additional new investment, right? And, you know, I think that the other thing that I think I see playing out, a very limited basis, very small sample size, but when I interact with shoreline homeowners who are making decisions about pulling their armoring versus, um, versus not or, or building something new, for example, um, the other thing that this kind of information seems to bring into play is the notion of additional investment and costs that will be required to maintain their, um, their, their armoring structure. Uh, versus, um, you know, the long-term benefit they might derive from, like, moving a, a, an at-risk structure, for example. So, um, I don't know if that sort of addresses what you were thinking about. But, uh, yeah, shoreline armoring is sort of built based on, usually built based on contemporary conditions. There's a, there's a strong movement in this region particularly about, uh, towards soft shore protection. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. Well, and also the argument I, I make again is that, you know, like um, where you have a shoreline armoring or a, a soft shore project, um, if if engineered well, uh, then it should be able to replicate a natural shoreline in terms of responding to changing ocean conditions, right? Um, so that's an advantage compared to a uh, com compared to sort of a traditionally engineered harm ar hard arming project, I think. Yeah, see what we can overcome. Right. Yep. So. Thank Yeah. I haven't. I've seen the, uh, some of the engineers present on it. Um, and, and actually, they're, they're, um, they're one of the early designs in which they tried to consider sea level rise projections. You know, there's a lot of effort right now within sort of the restoration and engineering community to try to figure out, well, what do you do? How do you build this kind of information into your designs? And that was an early project in which they attempted to at least make an effort to do so. But I've only ever seen presentations on that project. Do you know anything else about what is happening around here? Where there is a lot of water development mm -hmm. around here from the historical yeah. towns. And I haven't actually looked at the designs or anything, but I suspect that there are things that could assist the sea level rise. You know, I've had contact with a few folks that work for, um, I think, uh, I, I want to say the port, I could be wrong, and the name is escaping me at the moment, um, who uh, were planning some sea level rise vulnerability assessment work. I don't know if it's actually started. Um, if I think hard enough about it, I might be able to come up with the name of this person. No, not necessarily, no. And in fact, ideally, you know, like um, that's certainly something that we could, um, that we could do, but uh, oftentimes those processes are really ideally done very locally, right? Uh, because one of the primary things you want to get out of that is, as part of your vulnerability assessment, you want to get a clear sense about what is valuable, right? And value has lots of different metrics, associated, lots of different ways to measure it. So the thing that I always jump to is with the Jamestown Sklalem tribe when we were involved with that project. And here, there I was just doing this kind of impacts assessment stuff, like what do we expect? Um, it, it was, it was a, a, a comprehensive climate change assist. They didn't just consider sea level rise, they considered other climate change uh, associated impacts. There, um, you know, perhaps not surprisingly, one of their key vulnerabilities that emerged was, emerged was associated with salmon. And uh, they are not, they don't make a lot of money off salmon, right? So it wasn't an economic value. It was very much a cultural and spiritual value that drove that decision to focus on salmon uh, as, a, as a vulnerability. So those kind of locally derived values are critical in vulnerability assessment. Yes. Yes. What about the catastrophic stuff that's associated, like when the Fukushima earthquake in Japan? Yeah. Where there were many meters of sudden shift yes. in ocean bottom. And all yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so what? So, so this question does commonly come up. So I threw. I have this. Um, slide, it's not perfect, but this is a um, uh, modeled co-seismic subsidence associated with a subduction zone earthquake. Um, generally, we think that most of that co-seismic land movement, you know, associated with a seismic event, um, for crustal earthquakes probably isn't that dramatic. It may be locally important. Sorry, I'm getting, causing some 
problem or something. <laughs> um, but for the subduction zone earthquake, those, that, that co-seismic land movement can be dramatic. And so this is actually the model that's applied to tsunami inundation modeling by NOAA. This is for one of their uh, earthquake scenarios. The scale there is in meters. And in this case, it's a little confusing because red is actually down and blue, you know, lighter, uh, cooler colors are up. And so, you know, the intention here is to show, this is actually sort of the, the rip zone, the subduction, this is offshore. This is the subduction zone. Uh, rip zone, you know, suggesting that moves upward by, you know, 30, 40 feet, which is consistent with what they observed in Japan. That's what generates a tsunami potentially. And then along the coast here, you know, hopefully you can make out the tip of the Olympic Peninsula, Grays Harbor, Willapa Bay. This is the Columbia River. And so this model suggests, you know, on the order of one to two meters of co-seismic subsidence for those communities. So more or less instantaneous drop that dramatically changes their relative sea level pattern. Um, and you can see this in tide gauges too, from Kodiak and San Francisco even, where you see that pattern. Um, you'll note though that the modeling suggests that that signal doesn't make it very far into the inland waters. And um, there's a, a lot of effort right now to try to see if um, by using, um, you can go into salt marshes and core to try to find tsunami deposits. And those tsunami deposits in some cases actually tell you about subsidence. And thus far, where that's been done for salt marshes in Puget Sound and Hood Canal, the evidence has been very, very weak that, that, that there's probably much subsidence associated with these large events for the, um, you know, for the basin, for Puget Sound Basin and, and sort of the inner waters. But for those communities on the coast, this is something that we should be building into sea level rise work really hasn't been done yet. Largely tsunami planning and sea level rise planning have occurred separately, but certainly we're trying to figure out how to bring them together. I think this was the problem. Oh, okay. <laughs> so there's virtual modeling now. So the um, processes that we largely attribute it to uh, the bigger one is probably this tectonic deformation. So, um, you know, the subduction zone causing deformation of the landscape. Um, there's also a glacio-isostatic adjustment signal associated with deglaciation, probably still occurring from, um, you know, 16,000 years ago or something like that when, when, you know, glaciers left the landscape. Um, that's probably a, a smaller fraction of the signal. And you know, we don't necessarily try to separate them out. Um, there are GIA models out there. Uh, there are tectonic deformation models, but we don't make a giant effort to try to separate them out. We're just looking for that measured uh, signal, uh, whatever the process that drives it. But certainly like the pattern that we see that I showed you for Strait of Juan de Fuca where you have uplift and subsidence on, on the east side is consistent with tectonic deformation. But I don't know if you noticed, but in Puget Sound, if you look south to north, there is some suggestion, I think I have a laser beam, there is some suggestion of a gradient from south to north subsidence to uplift. That would be a consistent signal associated with like a glacial isostatic adjustment. Uh, yeah. I'm interested in the red dotted at point light on. Oh, up here, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so as I suggested, the, each of these dots is an observation. Um, I don't know uh, what that one is off the top of my head. Um, it's probably a GPS station, because um, Cherry Point tide gauge, well, that, is that Cherry Point tide gauge? So, that, so their tide gauges are in here. Anyway, I don't know if that's a tide gauge or a GPS station. It's not a leveling station. Um, there are no leveling data from up here. But um, there are places where we get discrepancies between an individual observation and our kind of best estimate surface. And in some cases, we don't necessarily know why that is. And one of the conversations we're having right now is how much confidence to ascribe to one observation that doesn't align with the others around it. Um, you'll, know, you'll note that this sort of is very different from these other observations around it. Yeah. 
And there are other places where that occurs, um, you know, down here, like Southwest Washington is really problem a problematic area. Um, that drives, so we have an uncertainty map, and there are large uncertainties for this region, and observations like that drive the uncertainty. Um, so, but it could be a local, very local thing occurring. If it is the tide gauge, it could be associated even with the tide gauge settling or moving in some way, shape, or form. Um, it could be associated with local faulting or local land movement. Um, there is a newly defined, um, there are actually three of them, and one of them goes along that line of blue, green, yellow, mm -hmm. green, and notice that orange one over there, we've been having earthquakes out there right, mm -hmm. right at that point, but there's a newly defined fault that runs parallel to the coastline, runs yep. parallel on that part of So the it's, it could be something local like that, certainly. So, but largely we sort of go, we don't know. <laughs> Um, there are some like this, you know, these kind of dots right here, which hopefully you see as being associated with um, uh, volcanoes in those cases. Yeah? So is there any work being done looking at, and this may not even be something worth looking at, but how the increase of the, uh, the land Yeah, so um, nothing that I've seen that I have felt like was compelling, right? There is every once in a while there are these sort of like, um, you know, people that sort of, um, well, there's always this recurrent, whenever there's a, like a subduction or earthquake, there's always this recurring thing that seems to go around about the tides and the relationship between tides and earthquakes. But, uh, and I don't do this kind of work, but, um, you know, USGS does, and they're always like, not true. Uh, there is no relationship between the two. I don't know. I tend to trust USGS. Um, so largely nothing that I've seen that's been compelling. Um, but again, that's not necessarily an area in which I work. So um, I wouldn't hazard too much detail until I had a chance to dig into it a little bit. 